Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. December is just rolling right along. What's today? 7th, 6th, 13th, 20th Christmas. Two more Sundays, and then uh, we'll be rolling downhill to Christmas. I'm so glad you're here. The psalmist talks about I was uh, just so good to come into the house of the Lord, and it is. It's good to see you. Good to see those of you who are over in the fellowship hall watching. Welcome. And also those of you who are at home who have joined us today, thank you for making this a priority. Uh, it's really kind of an interesting thing. Now, there's, you know, the, there's just a lot of threads that go uh, combine the mosaic of whoever happens to be gathered on any particular day to worship. But I can tell you, we have just a really, some really interesting flavors in here today. We have uh, some people who have just recently uh, come to Cochrane, moved to Cochrane from the great state of Hawaii. Yeah, and you know, that's pretty much everybody in Hawaii wants to move to Cochrane. And um, <clears throat> we're thankful that uh, this family was able to uh, find a home to uh, move into. And so that's really cool. And then uh, I had an opportunity to meet another couple that's with us today. And uh, they came all the way up from Australia uh, just to worship in Cochrane, Georgia. And so we've got uh, this is just all kind of things and we've got people watching down in uh uganda this morning and england and some other places it's just really kind of interesting right here from this little tiny town in the middle of georgia that we get to share life with a lot of different people okay some announcements i got to make some announcements um this is not necessarily ministry related but there's a lot of ministry that goes on in both of these uh, number one our competition cheer team uh, they went at it yesterday and i think they finished second am i right about that can anybody help me out with that? Yeah. Second place. And that's just kind of the first step. They've got more to come. And uh, then our um, high school football team is doing pretty good. I don't know if y'all know that or not. Um, they, uh, the, yeah. They uh, won a game down in Early County Friday night. And so they advanced another round in the state playoffs, be heading up to the mountains. And, um, Who's it, Raven County? Is that who, is that who we play coach? Uh, Raven County, this is coming up uh, Friday night. So uh, if you know anything about the leaders of those two things, our cheer, uh, competition cheer squad, our, our football team, you'll know there is a lot of ministry going on within the context of those two sporting groups. That's really a cool thing. I was talking to Vaughn yesterday on the phone a little bit, and um, one of the things he was sharing was how our, our area FCA uh, person was just talking about it's amazing uh, the things that we're able to do down here in our school system and the way we're able to talk about Jesus so clearly and I rejoice in that so good deal let me give you a reminder this is the month of Lottie Moon Christmas offering giving and of course the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions is uh, takes place every year during December 100% of the monies collected from the 50,000 uh, Southern Baptist uh, Convention churches all goes to uh, fund um, our international missionaries, career missionaries that are out there on the field. And so if you're looking for a place to uh, give a special gift in the Christmas season, you want it to count for something uh, really good, uh, consider a, a gift to the, uh, Lottie Moon. Last year, uh, we exceeded our goal by about $2,000. Our goal this year, we raised it a little bit as $12,000 for Lottie Moon. And if you're newer to the faith or if you're new to the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, I would encourage you to Google Lottie Moon and read her story. She was, she was a missionary before there was an international mission board, so to speak, of. And she, she literally, and I'm, I'm not talking about figuratively, she literally gave her life uh, in missions over in China and uh, actually died on a ship in the harbor. Um, and it was such a weakened condition because she had given away so much of her food to feed the people uh, that she was sharing Jesus with. It's an amazing story. And it's because of her wisdom that uh, the Christmas offering became a thing that we continue to do to this day. So anyway, it's really neat. Um, there you go. Drive-in movie night this Saturday night right out here in the parking lot. Big screen, hot chocolate, popcorn, uh, barbecue ribs, all those kind of things. Be right there. <clears throat> Uh, 6 o'clock p.m., uh, the Muppet Christmas Carol movie uh, will be shown. We do need some volunteers. I, we already have uh, a good number signed up. If, 
If you'd be willing to volunteer, and by volunteer, that just means you're going to be carrying popcorn and or hot chocolate, bottled water, whatever, to the different cars where people are. Instead, of everybody coming up and congregating. Uh, we're carrying that. And you can kind of watch the movie even while you do that. And that'll be fun. I think our legacy builders are doing the hot chocolate. Is that right? Making the hot chocolate. We're looking forward to that. Be some good stuff. I do need to say that uh, I mentioned this Wednesday night, there will not be uh, a rain plan, a rain or weather plan. If it's raining or snowing, why do y'all laugh? It snowed in North Georgia last week. So, weather. If it's raining or snowing and we're unable to view the movie, Obviously, we can't come inside, won't be able to do anything that night. We'll reschedule a drive-in movie night probably sometime in January. It may not be a Christmas movie. It may be something else. We're going to, we're going to get a drive-in movie event for our families, but it'll have to be probably after the first of the year if weather doesn't permit. We're just going to really trust that it does. Okay, any other announcements I need to make? Jeff, you know of anything? It's uh, so good to have you here today. I want to pray with you, and then we're going to sing some songs. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, it's the occasion of you sending your Son uh, to this earth that we celebrate all during this month, the birth of Jesus, the King of all kings, wrapped in the skin of humanity, come to offer himself uh, to pay the penalty for the sin of, of, of mankind. Father, in your incredible, great, perfect love for your creation, you chose out of your love to trade your perfect son for our sinful imperfection so that through Jesus we could come home one day. Father, remind us of that, not just this morning, but all through this holiday season, of how Christmas just demonstrates the depth of your love for your people. So we bow before you here in this sanctuary, in the sanctuary down the hall, in the sanctuaries across wherever people are sitting in their dens, their kitchens, on their back porch, wherever it might be. Father, by your Holy Spirit, tie our hearts together as we worship in spirit and truth. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's join our hearts and our voices together as we sing the Christmas story in this great loved Christmas hymn, O Come, All Ye Faithful. Let's stand together as we sing.
Lighting of the Advent candles, um, <clears throat> something we do sometimes, not every time, every year we're doing it this year. Uh, and so last week we talked about the candle of hope, and uh, in our Bible study we we looked at what what does hope mean, and really hope is only as good as the thing that you place your hope in. And uh, so I asked Chris to come up with. It's all right, your Bible, Chris. This is how many of you know Chris? Yeah. <laughs> Chris has been such a good friend over the years since Gail and I came to worship here. And um, there are several things that mark our church uh, as followers of Jesus Christ. And one of the things about our church is uh, we have some of the most incredible servants uh, of any church I've ever been in. People just roll up their sleeves and do whatever needs to be done. And then when it's done, they, they're happy that it's done. And uh, if, if you've been around the church at all, you know this, this dude right here serves constantly. And, uh, and, and when he's not, he's trying to wear out the concrete sidewalks uh, of Cochrane. <laughs> and and I, I love his heart. I, I love that he does what he does. He does it humbly, and he does it quietly, and he does it faithfully. And uh, if you're ever around on Wednesday night, stick your head in the kitchen and you will see this, this gentleman right here. Chris, I love you, brother. So today, you're going to light for us uh, the candle of faith. This is our second candle. I'm not going to light it right yet. Faith. What, what does Christmas teach us about faith? There's got to be something that goes with faith. James talks about that, about without, yeah, you know that verse. Faith, what does faith lead to? Is it just something we say? I want you to watch this video. It's going to be up on these two really big screens right behind me. I think we're going to dim the lights a little bit. Let's watch this, and then we'll light this candle. I am a furniture maker. I guess you could say I've been a furniture maker all my life. I was born into a furniture making family. My father was a furniture maker. His father was a furniture maker. It's in my blood. <laughs> say you love most about being a furniture maker? <laughs> what don't I love? 
Um, the smell, that aroma, when you when you enter the workshop of walnut and heart pine and oak, it's the smell. It's the smell of potential. You know, like I like to just take a piece of wood and 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 work with it and just dream. You know, what's this, what's this gonna be? You know, who is this table or this desk or this chair going to belong to someday? And, you know, and then there's, there's also the, um, the community part. Um, I love that, you know. It, I often get together with other furniture makers and talk about design and you know swap furniture making stories you know and talk about the latest article in the furniture making magazine that we read um yeah i i I love that i mean it's i know i know it's it sounds dorky but uh you know that's that's who i am (laughs) what would you say is your very favorite you know out of everything that you've done what is your favorite piece mm. of, of furniture? Mm. 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 Um, I'm sorry. Um, I said, uh, uh, you know, out of everything that you've made, what's your favorite piece of furniture? Well, I, I actually have never made a. A piece of furniture? What? Uh, like, you've never made anything? A chair or a table or, you know, mm. ashtray? No. How long did you say you've been doing this? Oh, 18 years. Okay, so in 18 years, you're telling me you've never made a single piece of furniture? Oh, look, I mean... Furniture making is, is is so much more than just producing things. Okay, it's 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 a way of life. Okay, this, this is this is my identity. This is what I grew up on. I mean, this is what I've invested in. That's what I that's what I think about. That's what I dream about. Yeah, yeah, I, I get that. It's just it seems like if you're going to call yourself a furniture maker that you maybe should have made a piece of furniture. <laughs> well, I didn't know we had a, an expert in furniture making here. <sighs> well, I don't even, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually, I actually feel kind of sorry for you right now. Why? Yeah, you're so, you're, 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 you're so narrow minded. Uh, f- furniture making, furniture making is life. Okay, and and there's not anyone that I know, there's not a single person I know, who is more committed, who's more dedicated to the art, to the ideas of furniture making than I am. And I am proud of what I do. I will tell the world. Nay, I will shout to the world. I am a furniture maker. The candle of faith. What does faith lead to? What's that all about? That's our second candle. Chris, you want to light that one for us? We add to the candle of hope. Uh, the Christmas candle of faith. They're also lighting the candle over in the um, in the fellowship hall right now. Thank you. I debated whether to say anything about this hymn uh, this Sunday, but after the encouragement, I got last Sunday from my good friend Trey Bellflower, uh, who I just felt like 
really appreciated all I had to say. And uh, the hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, was written uh, in, the, in the 1860s, pretty long time ago. Uh, if you enjoy history, if you think about history, you can timeline uh, when that might have been. But the writer of this hymn was a minister who went to Israel in 1865 and tells the story of riding a horse from Jerusalem down to Bethlehem. I went to Jerusalem. I went to the Holy Land in 18, 19. <laughs> Trey, you better not laugh too loud. I'll be longer. I went to Jerusalem in 1984. And uh, I, I rode by bus from Jerusalem down to Bethlehem, six miles. Philip Brooks rode a horse down from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, and he happened to be touring the Holy Land during Christmas. And so he was in Bethlehem on Christmas Day. And from that experience, he goes back to America. So I, I think about the traveling, the effort he had to take to make that not just from Jerusalem down to Bethlehem. He got back to his church, and he wanted to share the beauty and the, the fascination of that story with the children of his church. He was the pastor of the church. He wrote a poem about his experience, and he gave it to the choir director, and he said, uh, please write a tune for this, maybe for the children's program this coming Sunday. The choir director uh, apparently choir director took the challenge but was not without some struggle but Philip Brooks was six foot six and over 300 pounds so that might have had a little persuasion uh, encouraging his choir director but it was written and the day before it was written the day before it was performed for the first time and Philip Brooks in his words and word pictures he describes that experience what it must have been like when Christ was born a little town of Bethlehem I want you to observe as we sing. I want you to be aware of. I think we should sing hymns and verses that we sing to each other or tell each other the story, encourage one another in our faith. And the verses that we sing in the direction is up in prayer. I think we should sing those different. How that's different from you, I can't explain. But sing with understanding. Be aware. The first three verses of this hymn are telling that story, painting that picture of singing the Christmas story. And the fourth verse is the direction up. It's as in prayer. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. And we finish that hymn. I want us to sing just the last verse of the hymn of Away in a Manger, which is also a prayer. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay. Let's join our voices together again in song as we stand to sing this Christmas story, as we sing what we believe, as we sing our faith. O little town of Bethlehem. How still we see thee lie Above thy deep and dreamless sleep The silent stars go by Yet in the dark street shineth The everlasting light The hopes and fears of all the years met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars coming 
child they searched the inn to find a place for you were coming soon but there was no room for them to stay so in a manger filled with hay God's only son was born oh hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The shepherds left their flocks by night to see this baby wrapped in light. A host of angels led them all to you. And it was just as the angels said, you'll find him in a manger bed, Emmanuel and Savior, hallelujah, hallelujah. This baby boy would grow to be a man and one day die for me and you. My sins would drive the nails in you. That rugged cross was my cross too. Still every breath you drew was hallelujah.
Good job. Good job, Anna. She sings so well. And on top of that, she's pretty. <laughs> well, I'd either sing well than or am I pretty, but. <laughs> Somehow I knew somebody would do that. <laughs> Thank you, Don. I appreciate you. 19 days and counting. What are lessons that we learn from Christmas? Uh, one of them is that of faith. We're going to look at some people today that exemplify great faith. And as we do that, I want you to think about the question. How bold is your faith? How bold is your faith? What is faith? How do we define it? We could spend the rest of this day trying to really answer that question. But the Bible tells us over in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let that kind of soak in for a minute. Things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know, we, we exercise faith in a lot of different ways every day. We walk into a darkened room, we reach over, we flip the switch, we have faith that there's going to be light. We walk into the kitchen or the bathroom, we turn on the faucet, and we have faith that water is going to come out. We put the key in our ignition and we turn the key and we have faith that our vehicle is going to crank. And we don't think of it in those terms. We don't think about faith in that way, and we don't even, it, it's a subconscious or an unconscious thought that we have there about, uh, about these things. But faith is also a child getting up on Christmas morning and finding presents under the tree. Now, what is faith? I want to read something that I, I ran across this week as I was preparing for this. And, and I thought it was interesting, and I want you to just kind of listen to it. I don't normally read to you. Um, faith and belief are often used in the same context, sometimes interchangeably. But they are not quite the same. Belief is a strongly held opinion about an idea or one's view of life. Beliefs are also opinions that you form from what you read, hear, or see. Beliefs can change over time as you grow, as you mature, and as you learn new things. But faith is not something you start and build from. Faith can only be received. Now we're talking about spiritual faith here. Faith can only be received. It is given by God. Faith comes from hearing. And hearing by the word of God, so says Paul in Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Now the beautiful thing about faith that comes from God is the fact that it has the power 
to overcome fear, to be triumphant over doubt, and to give us the strength and the ability to be obedient to what God has for us to do as believers, regardless of how difficult it may sound or appear to us on the surface. And so I want us to think about these three people. They're, they are known to you well. They are the, the, they are main characters in the Christmas story. They are not the main character, but they are, they are players in it. Uh, the main character, of course, is Jesus. But this is about two people that uh, served as his parents. And then a group of guys we know as shepherds. So we're going to look, look at these folks for just a minute. Over in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, that's where we find uh, the announcement uh, from the angel to Mary uh, about the forthcoming birth. Now, this should not have been a real surprise because uh, some 700 years before uh, it had been prophesied. So now we see it beginning to come to fruition here. And, and, and Luke records it uh, and says, In the sixth month, uh, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. And he will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? But the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the, of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived her son in her old age. And now this is the sixth month uh, for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing is impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, how many times have we heard that story? I mean, I, I don't even remember the first time I heard it, but I, I've been hearing it for a lot of years. And on the surface, when we listen to it, we think, okay, well, that's a miraculous thing. That's a God thing. Uh, that's a very awesome thing. Uh, but think about what is underlying here. First of all, we're looking at a young lady who probably when the angel comes and appears to her is somewhere around 13, 14, 15 years old. She lives in a rather obscure village, not even on the trade routes, just a, a, a very poor village made up of poor people, people of, of no renown, people who are just eking out an existence or a living, going from day to day. And here is a lady who has no family who is known uh, as a prominent person. Now, as you read the scriptures, you understand Mary was of the lineage uh, of Jesus all the way along. I mean, it was, it just was that, that was a part of the big plan. But here, all of a sudden, 
just out of the blue. And who knows what Mary may have been doing at this particular point in time. God sends a messenger by the name of Gabriel. And he delivers one of the most astonishing messages that a young lady could have possibly heard in that day. Or any other day. You're going to be a mother. She's engaged to a guy named Joseph. They've got great plans. But notice in here that it said that she was astonished at his greeting. Well, who wouldn't be? I mean, you can, you, ladies, put yourself in her position. How would you have responded to what this angel said to Mary? You're going to be a mother. Whoa, <laughs> wait a minute. I know I'm engaged. But we're not married. So you can just imagine things already right now. To, to say that she was astonished may have been, been an understatement, but, but she is. And, and things start running through her mind. Now, in that, in that small framework of time, as he makes that announcement and Mary begins to process that, you can imagine wheels are spinning. She's trying to process this. She's trying to understand. There are so many thoughts that must be running through her mind, perhaps. Perhaps one of them would have been, wait a minute. If you have a child out of wedlock, the Old Testament law subjects you to being stoned to death. Well, think of the scandal. This is going to cause. I, I can't hide my pregnancy, so people are going to know, but they're also going to know Joseph and I are not married. Can you just imagine the ladies of the city coming to the to the well to draw water and their topic of conversation is going to be me? I'm the one they're going to be talking about. My family will be disgraced. I mean, all of these thoughts in that that micro moment. These are things that, that's got to be just flooding her mind at this time. And then, of course, what's Joseph going to think? What's Joseph going to say? Better than that, what's Joseph going to do? You know, all of these things come into her mind. But somehow, between what takes place there in verse 28, when he says, rejoice, uh, you're going to have a baby. From that verse, we get down to, to, to verse 38, where she says, just let it happen. Let it be to me according to your word. From, from that first initial contact from the angel, just a few verses later, she's saying, okay, let it happen. In the midst of all of this other stuff that must be running through her mind that she's thinking of, all of a sudden she says, let it be. Let it happen. I am submissive to that. How did that happen? Well, we don't know a whole lot about Mary's background as far as her relationship with God. But I believe we can rest assured in this, this fact. She had a very strong, personal, intimate relationship with God. So much so that of all of the people, all of the women, in all of Nazareth or Israel, for that matter, God singled her out. She was not perfect. Contrary to some teaching, she was not a dispenser of grace. She was a recipient of grace. 
She was no one special not to be put upon a pedestal. But she had to have some sort of strong, intimate, personal relationship with God so that he selected her from all of the other women, young ladies, the maidens, to be the vehicle through which the Christ child would be born. In the midst of that relationship with God, Mary had a strong, strong faith, a bold faith. And it was that bold faith that allowed her to go from being astonished to being willing to say, let it be. She didn't understand everything. I'm sure I am, I'm not, I can't prove this, but I'm almost positive she had to have questions uh, maybe some fears or some doubts just momentarily there. But because of that great faith, the fear of being stoned, the fear of scandal, the fear of gossip, uh, all of that other stuff was done away with because of her faith. So strong and so bold was her faith and her relationship to God that she didn't worry about that. She wasn't concerned about that. She said, God's got this. You won't find that in the King James either. But she was able to say, I'm okay with this. I'm willing to allow God to use me in this manner. And I'll let him take care of the, the gossipers. And, and the talk that's going to take place. I'm not going to be concerned with that. I'm not going to deal with that. And I'm not even worried about what is going to happen with Joseph because I know my God's going to take care of that too. <coughs> Her faith was that bold. Her faith was that strong that she was able to move in the direction of obedience to allow God to use her. Okay, let's move to Joseph then. Over in Matthew chapter 1 and in verse 18, a little bit different account. Doesn't deal with Mary here. Deals with, uh, deals with Joseph more. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Well, that just sums up everything we've read over there in Luke chapter 1. Now here comes Joseph in the picture. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and wanting to, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall, bring, uh, a ch uh, shall be with a child and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being translated is God with us. Then Joseph, here we go. Then Joseph being aroused from his sleep did as the angel commanded him and took, uh, took him his wife and did not know her until she had brought forth, forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Okay, Joseph, key player. You know, we never hear Joseph saying anything in the scriptures. You ever notice that? There's not one recorded thing Joseph ever said. But he is pivotal in this Christmas story and exemplifies, as Mary did, great faith. First of all, what we know about him. 
he, he was a simple carpenter. He was a furniture maker. <laughs> Only I think he made furniture. His family had no notoriety either. He was just a simple carpenter. Engaged to a lady that he loved dearly, whose name was Mary, and they had made plans. You, you can imagine, uh, as any young couple uh, that really love one another and looking forward to being married, engaged, all this stuff, what they're looking forward to, they're excited about their making plans, uh, you know. And now all of a sudden, his world is shattered by the news that Mary is with child. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I know what the law says, that she's to be stoned. She's to be, you know, sort of like a divorce. She's to be put away. Um, you know, if I acknowledge that the child is mine, then I'm going to be guilty of immorality, and there's a whole lot of stuff associated with that. And there's going to be the gospers. And if I do that, that's going to deny the virgin birth. It's going to cancel out the prophecy. Um, what's going to happen to Mary if I, if I don't do something here? See, a lot of stuff now goes through his mind that he's got to process, that he's got to deal with, that he's got to come to grips with. He's thinking on these things, but then God appears to him in a dream, uh, or through a dream. And the angel said, don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife. So how does he go from the fear factor of all of the complications associated with this announcement of her being with child? How does he go from that fear factor to the faith factor of saying, okay, I'll marry her. I don't care about the gossipers. I don't care what the gossipers say. I don't care about what the scandal sheets may say. I'm not concerned about that. Because God's in charge. And I don't have to be concerned about that. Because I have faith in my God that he's going to take care of that. And if you know the story, the rest of the story, even after the birth of Christ, you see God at work in the life of this couple, Mary and Joseph, taking care of every situation that they came in contact with. If, if you listened Wednesday night to PK's message, you heard him talk about the, the wise men bringing the gold, the frankincense and myrrh. That's what financed the trip down to Egypt. That's what they lived. So God provided. So all of this hadn't happened, but Joseph understood that the God he knew and the God he served and the God he had a relationship and the God he had faith in would take care of everything that was coming his way. And so he didn't have to worry about it. He just did what he was commanded or, or told to do. That's what faith did for Joseph. His faith was that bold. He just wasn't worried about what people said. He just obeyed. Well, then we move back over to the Gospel of Luke and we find a group of men called the Shepherds. I love these guys. I don't know any of their names. We don't even know how many there were. We just know that there were some guys who were out on the hillside uh, taking care of some sheep. Luke 2.8 begins... Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord uh, stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. But then the angel said, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the 
a heavenly host, a multitude, a heavenly host, uh, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Watch this. So it was that when the angels were gone away into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord had made known to us. And they made haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. These men were social outcasts. Now, at one time, being a shepherd was a rather well thought of profession. I mean, Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. Uh, but, but somehow, somewhere along the way, shepherding had gone downhill and shepherds just weren't thought of very highly. They weren't, uh, they weren't invited to Christmas parties or birthday parties or family reunions or any social gathering. They were pretty well looked upon as thieves and liars. And on top of that, they didn't smell good. And so they were kind of ostracized by society. They were just kind of pushed to the side. They weren't, uh, they weren't held in high esteem. And isn't that ironic that the first people who got the message about the birth of Jesus was this group of so-called lowlifes? Tell me God don't have a sense of humor. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't the religious leaders. It wasn't uh, the priests or any of those guys. Ah, it was the shepherds out there in the woods or in the hillside. They had no way of knowing they were the first to know that. But, but they didn't go to town because they knew people didn't want them there. And they knew people talked about them. And people were ugly to them and nasty and mean towards them. And, and so they didn't go to town. But now all of a sudden they get this news. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this whole angelic host is praising God. Can you imagine? Can you even imagine what it was like out there? pitch black dark except maybe for a small campfire and then all of a sudden it's like the greatest Christmas light show you have ever seen. Boom! In the skies outside of Bethlehem are illuminated with the heavenly hosts giving this great news to these guys. And they get this news, and when they have gone away, the guys get together, these shepherds come together, and, and, and can you imagine the conversation? I mean, we got just some idea of one little part of it, but I got a feeling, I got a feeling there's a lot to be said that night. But notice what they said. Let us go and see what God has made known to us. All of a sudden, they no longer cared about what people might think, what people might say. They had had, to say a divine revelation is as close as I can come to what this announcement was. They were told about the birth of a Savior, and that meant more to them. And, and what kind of religious affiliation or spiritual uh, uh, affinity this group had, we don't know. There had to be some sort of connection there, some sort of deep-seated faith there for them to decide to dispense with, with culture and custom and leave behind the sheep to go to town to be subjected, perhaps, to, to the, uh, to borrow a phrase, the, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune to see what they had been privileged to hear. 
And it says they went. They went. And they found the baby lying in a manger. What, what made them go and put all of that behind? It was a great faith that they had been privileged to this great announcement. And they had to see it. Hearing it was great news, but they wanted to see. God had given them this message, but also told him, you will find the babe. That's like an invitation. Y'all go. If angels said y'all, y'all go. And, and, and these guys went. And they didn't care about what the people might say. They said, we'll let God handle that. If you read the rest of that story, it says as soon as they left Jesus, they went through the streets telling everybody. And you can imagine that turned a few heads too. But it was their faith that led them to be obedient to God. That faith gave them to freedom to act upon God's revelation. And so they went. So what's our takeaway from all of this? Faith says that obedience should supersede our doubts and our fears and leave it all to God because he has a plan. Let God handle those details. At the beginning, I ask you how Bold is your faith. How strong is your faith? And that's the question I close with. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You can't just get up one morning and say, well, I think I'll have a little faith today. Faith is something that is God-given. And that comes only when you have that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The folks in our stories today had a relationship with God, the depth of which we do not know fully. Suffice it to say, it was deep enough. It was strong enough. It was bold enough for them to be obedient to God. And when we have a, that personal relationship with God, we can have a bold faith as well. But it begins by knowing Jesus as your personal Savior. And if you don't know him today, my prayer is that this Christmas season, you would receive the greatest gift of all. And that is the gift of God's salvation. God so loved the world that he gave that first Christmas gift. God, give us bold faith. Join me as we pray. We'll be dismissed. Thank you for uh, your presence today, uh, for your kind attention. Uh, and if you'll just stand, we'll pray. And you can go to the house. You can go to sugar berries. You can go to Nicole's. You, you can go anywhere you want to go. <laughs> All right. Father, thank you for your word and what it teaches us during this Christmas season about faith. God, may we learn from that. We pray that you would give to us the, the bold faith that would lead us to obedience in all that you have to do for us. We know you have a plan for our lives. May we be bold enough in our faith and our relationship to you to follow that plan. Thank you for those that are here today in the building, here at the fellowship hall, for those that are watching uh, from all over. Uh, we don't know where uh, they all are watching from, but uh, just bless each one in a very special way today. And thank you for giving us Jesus. Amen.